on World News Tonight. Concerning curbs, continuing protests in China draw attention and condemnation from global leaders. New concerns, Mauna Loa's eruption becomes a cause of worry with authorities hoping for the best and preparing for the worst. New hope, humanity's fight against Alzheimer's takes a step forward with a possible miracle cure. And a stunning return, pinnacle performances of K-pop grace Japan's stage once more. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News tonight. And we start off tonight's coverage with some grim news in China. As China's former leader Zhang Zemin, who came to power after the Tiananmen Square protests, has died at the age of 90 states. State media said that he died just after noon today. One of the major figures of Chinese history in recent decades, he presided over a time where China opened up on a vast scale and saw high-speed growth. He oversaw the peaceful handover of Hong Kong in 1997 and China's entry into the World Trade Organization in 2001, which intervened with the country's economy with that of the international community. His death comes as China sees some of its most serious protests since the Tiananmen with many demonstrations against COVID restrictions. China's vast security apparatus has moved swiftly to smother mass protests that swept the country with police patrolling streets, checking cell phones and even calling some demonstrators to warn them against a repeat. Protesters clash with police in the Chinese city of Guangzhou on Tuesday night. These videos obtained from social media show people throwing objects at the police. On the other side, dozens of riot police in all-white pandemic gear hold shields over their heads. Guangzhou is a sprawling port city north of Hong Kong in Guangdong province. In videos that seem to show earlier in the day, people were seen gathering around barricades in the manufacturing hub. Videos were filmed in Guangzhou, but could not verify the sequence of events, nor what sparked the clashes. However, scenes of protest have become common across China over the past few days as anger about strict COVID-19 rules three years into the pandemic appears to be boiling over onto the streets. National health officials said on Tuesday that China would respond to the, quote, urgent concerns raised by the public and that rules will be implemented more flexibly. Hours later, officials in Guangzhou said they would allow close contacts of COVID cases to quarantine at home. Meanwhile, in Zhengzhou, home to a Foxconn factory making Apple iPhones that has also seen COVID protests, officials announced the orderly resumption of businesses, including supermarkets, gyms and restaurants. Some elderly residents on the streets of Shanghai expressed fear about the easing of restrictions. I will be pretty worried if curbs are eased, especially for the elderly who haven't been vaccinated. And if it opens up, it will be more troublesome for the elderly to get this disease. Now the state is still providing vaccines, so protect yourself. The state cares about you, so it will get better. If the elderly doesn't get vaccinated, they will be quite worried. While the easing of some measures appear to be an attempt to appease the public, authorities have also begun to seek out those who have been at recent protests. A Beijing resident told that police had come to their home and got them to complete a written record. Another resident said some friends who posted videos of protests on social media were taken to a police station and asked to sign a promise that they would not do it again. Beijing's Public Security Bureau did not comment. In a statement that did not refer to the protests, the Communist Party's top body in charge of law enforcement agencies said that China would crack down on, quote, the infiltration and sabotage activities of hostile forces. The wave of civil disobedience is unprecedented in mainland China since President Xi Jinping assumed power a decade ago. Ongoing protests in China against the country's zero COVID prevention scheme have led to global figures voicing their concerns. The United States has reiterated its position in support of the peaceful protests, while the IMF said that it's been recommending that China eases its curbs as supply chain disruptions have become a major concern in China. United States Secretary of State Antony Blinken has reiterated his support for the ongoing protests in China against the country's strict zero COVID policy. When it comes to 
protests, protests that we're seeing in China, protests that we're seeing for uh, different reasons uh, uh, in Iran, uh, in other places. Our position is, uh, is the same everywhere, which is that we support the right of people everywhere to peacefully protest, to make known their views, their concerns, uh, and their frustrations. The head of the International Monetary Fund, Kristalina Georgieva, meanwhile, voiced her concerns regarding the negative effects China's antivirus curbs are inflicting on the world economy. We have been recommending for some time now a recalibration of China's zero-COVID policy, exactly because of the impact it has both on people and on the economy. A deadly fire last Thursday in Urumuchi, the capital of the far western region of Xinjiang, killed at least 10 people in an apartment building, igniting protests nationwide after videos appeared to show lockdowns delaying firefighters from reaching victims in time. CNN reports the local government said it would gradually lift the measures without providing a clear time frame. Protesters holding symbolic blank sheets of paper have even demanded Chinese President Xi Jinping step down after having overseen the nation's virus prevention scheme for three years. While demonstrations in many areas have dispersed peacefully, other protesters have reportedly met stronger responses from Chinese police forces. Amidst the continuing assault on Ukraine from Russian troops, NATO is hoping to provide a more stable footing for the country with increased aid promised along with essential assistance in getting directly affected power grids back on. NATO has pledged to boost its support to Ukraine. It announced on Tuesday that it would help Kyiv rebuild energy infrastructure that's been heavily damaged by Russian shelling. That's after NATO's chief said Moscow was using the winter cold as a weapon of war. Russia is uh, using brutal missile and drone attacks uh, to leave Ukraine cold and dark this winter. Russia has been carrying out heavy attacks on Ukraine's power grid almost weekly since October. Kyiv says it's a deliberate campaign to harm civilians and calls it a war crime. British Foreign Secretary James Cleverly accused Putin of trying to freeze the Ukrainians into submission. I don't think it will be successful. In fact, I know it won't be successful because they've shown a huge amount of resilience and we will continue to, to support them through these difficult months. Russia acknowledges attacking Ukrainian infrastructure but denies deliberately seeking to harm civilians. Meanwhile, soldiers on the ground in Ukraine say they're starting to struggle as winter begins to bite. Heavy rain and falling temperatures are making conditions even grimmer along the front lines. What can I tell you? We're more or less okay. But it's a bit harder now because of the rain and a light frost. It's a swamp. You can see it yourself. It's dried up a bit today, but it's okay. We're holding up. <laughs> Some military analysts say they expect Ukraine will try to keep up the pressure on Russian forces over the winter to prevent them from digging in and settling. The First Lady of Ukraine, Olena Zelenska, thanked the UK Parliament on her visit to the country and urged the government to help take action against the Russian onslaught. Her visit also drew focus to sexual violence in the regions of conflict. The Ukrainian First Lady Olena Zelenska is visiting the UK to highlight the plight of the Ukrainian people. During her visit, she addressed the House of Commons, thanking Britain for its support in the war against Russia. The speech comes as Ukraine enters its ninth month of conflict with Moscow's forces. I urge you, Britain, I urge you, members of Parliament, to help us unite the global community as much as possible, as it once was united in 1942. Unite the world in support of a special tribunal for Russian crimes against Ukraine. Today I'm asking you to become a world leader of justice. Nothing more, nothing less. Fight the 
situation in your country. The First Lady also attended the Preventing Sexual Violence in Conflict Initiative Conference in London. Zelenska demanded a global response to the use of sexual violence as a weapon of war. She claimed Ukrainian prosecutors are currently investigating more than 100 possible crimes by Russian soldiers. The group of seven wealthy democracies, all the G7, agreed to set up a network to coordinate investigations into war crimes as part of a push to prosecute suspected atrocities in Ukraine. The systemic destruction of energy infrastructure by Russia in Ukraine is a war crime. German Justice Minister Marco Bushman made the statement following a meeting with his G7 counterparts on Tuesday. It comes as line workers in Ukraine race to repair the nation's battered power grid, following a wave of attacks as temperatures plummet. We have also agreed on concrete measures on how to better coordinate our investigations in order to take better action against the war crimes committed by the Russian side on the soil of Ukraine. One must always remember the Ukrainian investigative authorities alone have now documented almost 50,000 cases of war crimes. Bushman added that the meeting sends out the message war crimes must not go unpunished. Officials in Kiev are also calling for a trial to persecute atrocities committed on Ukrainian soil, including the discovery of mass graves in Izum last September, containing the remains of more than 400 bodies. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back to World News Tonight. A dangerous weather picture is unfolding in the deep south of the U.S., which predicts the possibility of a severe thunderstorm and a high tornado risk, putting an estimated 17 million people at risk. Tonight, as much of the South braces for the terrifying prospect of tornadoes, it's a sudden reality for residents in Louisiana as a tornado has already touched down. And in Alabama's Muscle Shoals, chairs and furniture are being sucked away by wind and rain. In this region alone, some 17 million under threat of severe weather sweeping through a corridor of major southern cities and capitals, where nocturnal tornadoes are two and a half times more likely to be deadly. In the command center of Mississippi's Emergency Management Agency, a fully activated team stays in touch with some 80 plus emergency directors and prepares shelters. All of it not far from Jackson, where only months ago, flooding caused outages at two water treatment facilities, spawning a water crisis. And the active weather has only started tearing through parts of the upper Midwest. Americans bracing for the next 24 hours. French President Emmanuel Macron begins his three-day state visit to the U.S. bolstered by shared bilateral visions on Russia's invasion of Ukraine and China's assertiveness in the Indo-Pacific. But President Joe Biden's latest Inflation Reduction Act has alarmed the EU and the French leader will have to stake a firm position on U.S. subsidies and protectionism. Just a year ago, relations between the U.S. and France were at a low point. A very public spat between the two countries cost Paris a valuable submarine deal with Australia. And in the fallout, President Emmanuel Macron recalled the French ambassador to the US for consultation. Now as Macron heads to Washington on a state visit, the two countries are keen to show they've put all their issues behind them. The meeting is set to be the first state visit of Joe Biden's presidency, and Washington has left the world under no illusions as to why it chose France for the occasion. I mean, if you look at what's going on in Ukraine, look at what's going on in the Indo-Pacific and the tensions with China, France is really at the center of all those things. Uh, and President Macron uh, has been a dynamic leader inside the G7, uh, particularly uh, there in Europe. Uh, and so the president felt that uh, this was exactly the, the right and the most appropriate country to start with for state visits. Along with those issues, the U.S.'s newly passed Inflation Reduction Act which has been a sticking point between the two countries, is also set to be on the agenda for talks. The legislation provides tax credits to consumers who buy green technology made in the US, including electric vehicles. Brussels has argued these subsidies amount to unfair protectionism, while France says the law threatens to put European manufacturers at a competitive disadvantage. As if the twin transition and the energy crisis was not challenging enough, we now have to deal uh, of some of the negative impact 
of the U.S. Inflation Reduction Act. Behind these measures imposed by the U.S. Uh, lies a much more um, important risk, I believe, which is a complete change in investment flow. Despite Europe's concerns, the White House argues the legislation goes a long way in helping the U.S. meet global efforts to curb climate change. Still in the U.S., the GOP is not keeping quiet on Trump's controversial dinner with far-right activist Nick Fuentes, denouncing any claims the activists may have with the Republican Party. Party. GOP House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy on Tuesday condemned a white nationalist who dined last week with former President Donald Trump. These were McCarthy's first public comments about Trump's dinner with far-right activist Nick Fuentes and the rapper Ye, formerly known as Kanye West, at the president's Mar-a-Lago resort, a meeting drawing widespread criticism. Fuentes has been described as a white supremacist by the U.S. Justice Department. The Anti-Defamation League, which tracks extremists, says Fuentes once jokingly denied the Holocaust and that he compared Jews burnt in concentration camps to cookies in an oven. Ye has also drawn widespread criticism and seen the loss of multi-million dollar sponsorship deals over anti-Semitic statements and tweets threatening Jewish people. Trump, in a message on his Truth social media site, said he met with Ye and, quote, we got along great. He expressed no anti-Semitism and I appreciated all the nice things he said about me on Tucker Carlson. Why wouldn't I agree to meet? Also, I don't know Nick Fuentes, Trump wrote. Trump's meeting with Ye and Fuentes has sparked criticism from some Republicans, even prompting a rare rebuke from former Vice President Mike Pence. In an interview with News Nation, Pence said, quote, President Trump was wrong to give a white nationalist, an anti-Semite, and a Holocaust denier a seat at the table. I think he should apologize for it, and he should denounce those individuals and their hateful rhetoric without qualification. But while McCarthy condemned Fuentes, he was careful not to criticize the Republican former president directly, who earlier this month announced he was once again seeking the White House. But in the Senate, Republican minority leader Mitch McConnell had even stronger words, suggesting that Trump's choice of dinner guests were disqualifying for a presidential candidate. First, let me just say that there is no room in the Republican Party for anti-Semitism or white supremacy. And anyone meeting with people advocating that point of view, in my judgment, are highly unlikely to ever be elected president of the United States. Stunning new images have come in of the first eruption of the world's largest active volcano in a generation. Hawaii's Mauna Loa is spewing lava as high as 200 feet into the sky and putting residents on alert. Hawaii Island medical professionals are standing by for a potential influx of patients coming in with volcanic smog-related respiratory issues. However, hospital officials said that there has not been an increase in visits yet. Tonight, the awesome ancient power of Mother Nature on full display as Mauna Loa roars to life. After a four decades long slumber, the world's largest active volcano is now spewing molten lava and raining ash near the very top of Hawaii's big island. Mauna Loa is erupting. The volcano exploding after several weeks of intensifying earthquakes. Scientists say any eruption of this magnitude is a potential threat, but so far it's been contained to the volcano's northeast rift zone near its crater, not predicted to impact surrounding communities. Still, eruptions are dynamic and unpredictable. Officials are urging vigilance, asking residents to be ready to leave at a moment's notice, opening the island's emergency center and shelters. Southwest Airlines even pre preemptively canceling flights out of caution. This is Mauna Loa's first eruption since 1984, but Big Island has weathered several since. Its little sister Kilauea erupted in 2018, rampaging for weeks, destroying more than 700 homes. This time, another geological wonder as Mauna Loa performs a fire dance for the ages. We have some good news for you. The first drug to slow the destruction of the brain in Alzheimer's has been heralded as momentous. The research breakthrough ends decades of failure and shows a new era of drugs to treat Alzheimer's, the most common form of dementia, is possible. Yet, the medicine Lakenabab has only a small effect and its impact on people's daily lives is debated. And the drug works in the early stages of the disease, so most would miss out without a revolution in spotting it. Alzheimer's Research UK said that the findings were momentous.
Welcome back to World News tonight and for more news let's take you around the world in a minute. Australia's parliament voted to censure former Liberal Prime Minister Scott Morrison after an inquiry found his secret appointment to multiple ministries during the COVID-19 pandemic undermined trust in the government. The United States booked their place in the World Cup last 16 by beating Iran 1 for 0 in Qatar, with Christian Pulisic bundling the ball home in a Group B showdown shrouded by decades of enmity between the two nations. With three astronauts abroad, China's Shenzhou 15 spaceship entered the country's space station and met with another astronaut trio, a historic gathering that added the manpower at the in-orbit space lab to six for the first time. More than 13,000 birds, mainly pelicans, have died in Peruvian coast in recent weeks following an outbreak of avian influenza in the Andean country. Women and girls marched in the seats of Mexico City protesting recent botched investigations of violent crimes against women in the country, where recorded numbers of murders of women are rising sharply. Somalia's healthcare sector is reeling from continual displays of violence and terrorist activities, as well as droughts, hospitals struggling to keep up with the seemingly unending influx of patients. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories we add tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. We leave you tonight with the visuals of K-pop stars lighting up a stage in Japan for the Mnet Asian Music Awards, which was being held for the first time in three years. Thank you for watching. Have a good night.